This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. It's the end of an era. It's been almost five years since Jodie Whittaker was handed the TARDIS keys from Peter Capaldi and Chris Chibnall took over as showrunner. An era mired in reactionary controversy, compromised productions and upendings of the status quo. So it's oddly fitting that The Power of the Doctor, a feature-length special broadcast to also celebrate the BBC centenary, seems to have predominantly opted to sidestep all of that. Storylines built up for literal years like The Timeless Child, The Fugitive Doctor and more are just ignored in order to deliver a pretty self-contained finale that sees the 13th Doctor and companion Yaz face off against the unholy trinity of Doctor Who foes, the Master, the Daleks and the Cybermen. But they're not alone, with classic companions, doctors, and old guard establishments like Unit there to face the danger. Honestly, the best comparison I can think of would be like if you were watching the fifth Doctor's tenure, then all of a sudden the five Doctors happened and Peter Davison regenerated at the end of it. It's more of a celebration that is mostly disconnected from what's come before. But does it work? Is it still a fitting tribute to the 13th Doctor? Well, let me back up. The story starts with the 13th Doctor and companions Yaz and Dan attempting to rescue a speeding bullet train. In. Space! That's being attacked by the Cybermasters, last seen in the Timeless Children. They save the crew, but the Cybermasters acquire the cargo, and Dan has a near-death experience that causes him to call it quits on time and space. The Doctor and Yaz are then left to pursue the trail on their own, which leads to a second moon that has appeared above Earth in 1916 under the control of the Cybermen. The Master has also infiltrated the Tsar of Russia, disguised as Grigory Rasputin, and has faced 15 world famous paintings which gets the attention of unit and former companion ace played by sophie aldred returning on screen after 33 years but the master's not done he's also kidnapped 13 of the world's best seismologists as he's working with the daleks to disrupt earth's tectonic plates which has been investigated by former companion tegan played by janet fielding returning after 38 years one dalek though has defected and seeks the doctor's help a shard is back after being cloned by the master and basically it's all hands on deck to stop the master from destroying the doctor's favorite planet but also her very legacy with the master harnessing the power of a quarrenx that was the cargo at the beginning of the story to force the 13th doctor to not only regenerate but to regenerate specifically into the master with the 13th doctor gone it's up to the power of the doctor which is the friends they made along the way to defeat the master daleks and the cybermen and get our favorite time lord back Oh, and Vinder is there as well. The power of the Doctor doesn't make the best first impression. Well, actually, I'm fibbing when I say that because the actual first scene, the train chase set piece, is actually really strong. It's a fun set piece that reintroduces the Cybermasters with cool shades of black and regenerative abilities, with terrific camera work and daring stunts. And when the Cybermen steal what appears to be a young child away from the Doctor, it was a genuine surprise. It was a really cool opener, fun enough to be enjoyable, but with real stakes involved, especially when Dan gets his space helmet shot through by a Cybermaster and nearly dies. Honestly, I think as soon as he got back to solid ground, he knew his time was up. Character-wise, this makes a lot of sense. I just wish that Nadia Albina, who plays his girlfriend Diane, had an appearance in the special for Dan to actually depart with. It feels like a major part of Dan's character did not get its due here. But the bad first impressions take a hold when we exit the opening credits and we're greeted with the familiar Chibnall yellow text with the locations and dates. Siberia 1916, London 2022, Tegan's in Romania, the master goes to St. Petersburg. Honestly, it feels like a dartboard approach to adding scale and it comes across as Chibnall funnily enough on autopilot now he wasn't the first one to add extraneous locations that only exist to add scope i think it was stephen moffat who started that but chibnall seems to use it as a crux for story momentum then you throw in wait a second let me get the dartboard okay uh 15 famous paintings and 13 seismologists in naples Ah, oh, there we go we've got our first act now 
And I mention autopilot because Chibnall has done this a lot before. The Battle of Ranskor Av Kolos had nine distress signals, Spyfall opened in West Africa, the Pacific Ocean, and Moscow. Resolution had the three armies scatter the Dalek in the 9th century on Anuta Island in Siberia and in Yorkshire. It all sounds impressive on paper, but I think the audience are almost tuned at this point to treat these locales as just throwaway and superfluous rather than adding scale to the story, unlike something like Praxius from series 12, which was probably the best implementation of this trope of the era. But sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. So we have all of these elements, the Cybermasters guarding the Quarrenx, the Dalek Defector and the Master as Rasputin defacing the paintings and shrinking the seismologists, and part of me just wants to accept this as Sasha Dewan's master just flexing. Like he wanted to bring in the Cybermen and the Daleks to make a symbolic point how he's got his own fam to counter the Doctors, and maybe he chose Rasputin because, I don't know, he had that costume ready to go when he had to work with it. But the Doctor at one point actually asks if this was all just a diversion, and the master says... So everything else was a diversion? No. No. Not a diversion. Very important. Three face plan. You'll see. Except you won't. <laughs> and then he never actually says why it's important. Why did he need Sir Nicholas's place? Why is he trying to take over the Doctor's body and destroy Earth at the same time? Surely he's spreading himself too thin. And considering that we've got the Daleks and Tegan in this story, I was hoping the Master would learn from the Daleks' inability to multitask from Resurrection of the Daleks, but it was not to be, it seems. Oddly enough, though, some of this overplotting does feel justified to an extent. Yeah, it does absolutely make sense that the Master has authority over the Cybermen, especially if he still has the Siberium in him, though that's confirmed in a throwaway line and is never factored into the special again. I ingested the Siberian, the battle AI of the Cybermen. I have so many steps ahead. I can see it all. Right through to all our ends. And if he destroyed Gallifrey and ransacked the capital, he'll have the Time Lord tech to force the Doctor to regenerate, and that Russian doll Cyberman that's bigger on the inside, this checks out. Though why on earth he cloned a Shad, a rogue agent who might not be a very reliable ally, it's all very confusing. All of this does seem to serve a structural point, however, in that it does manage to bring everyone together near the beginning, but then split them apart again in organic ways. With Tegan and Kate dealing with the Cybermen at unit, Ace fighting off the Daleks and even meeting Graham along the way, Yaz and Vinda trying to save the Doctor and stop the Master, it still feels like Chibnall is finding a solution to a problem he imposed on himself, but I am surprised at how well it holds together. And just like with the Vanquishers, splitting the Doctor up into three so she can have agency over the subplots, we get the Hollow Doctor, which is an inspired choice for this type of story, because it allows her to be involved, even though she's not properly present, and we get the callbacks to companion appropriate Doctors, but more on that later. Though my compliment on the Doctor having agency here is contradicted when you've got her being locked up in the Dalek casing. And what we essentially have for like the fifth or sixth time in this era of the show, the Doctor just imprisoned and stuck in place as she is exposited to. I know that the Doctor being kidnapped is not exclusive to this incarnation, but it does feel like Jodie Whittaker, the first female Doctor, is an incarnation who spends a disproportionate amount of time in captivity and being lectured to. I don't know, the gendered optics of her always being kidnapped it doesn't look great. Anyway, going back to the Daleks and the Cybermen, I'm in two minds about it, because they obviously play second fiddle here, but they still have some really interesting texture thrown into their mythology. A Dalek in a battered casing summons the Doctor, claiming to want to end the Dalek mission because their original mission of preserving the Khalid race has failed. That's a great idea, and very in character with the Daleks and fascism in general for moving the goalposts and having such arbitrary definitions on what purity is. Though, I no longer believe in the Dalek mission. Well, that's a new one. Doctor, you literally met a Dalek defector during your last incarnation. You actually met him on your final day. But yeah, while it's cool to see the Daleks go back to their Terry Nation mining days, and it's a cool image to see the Doctor forced inside of an empty Dalek casing. 
the Daleks are the weakest villain element of the story. The Cybermen, on the other hand, they not only get the opening set piece, but we get the awesome looking Cybermasters with exquisitely detailed armor and regeneration abilities, but even the Cyber Warriors themselves feel like a legit threat when they invade unit, and the callback to gold, that was a nice touch. Gold bullets, Tinnet! The unit wouldn't be ready! One of my favourite moments of the episode is this shot where Ashad breaks the master from his prison. Now, it's not exactly the hallway scene from Old Boy or anything, but this one long take makes Unit feel like a real place with a geography that Ashad has to strategically manoeuvre through. Not to mention he's taking these Unit forces apart single handedly. It's so cool. No idea how the master managed to leave behind that device in the pipe however. Such a good plan. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it is master. You want to let us know how you pulled that off? Anyway, Ashad, when he's converting the unit soldiers, he refers to the conversion upgrading process as ascension. They shall begin their ascension, as you shall now receive yours. Now, this is consistent with his language in Series 12's Ascension of the Cybermen, however, I thought in that story he was just referring to the brand new Cyber Warriors, or the importance he gave himself as a mythic figure attempting to win the Cyber Wars, but it turns out that he views upgrading in and of itself as a form of Ascension. It's a cult. Ashad is a cult leader. This twist and recontextualization of the formula with the Daleks and the Cybermen are just little details that never get expanded upon here because there's too much other stuff happening and the Master is the main focus, but it's cool all the same. It just feels like these are ideas that could be their own episodes in and of themselves and they're just thrown away here. And practically, the most useful thing that the non-Ashad Cybermen do is interrupt the boring exposition. A metal planet with the currents at the heart of it, on the edge of Earth in the second decade of the 20th century. Why? Desist exposition. This special is getting way too complicated. Ah, decided to show your face, have you? Is this planet you're doing? No, actually, it's the Quark's handiwork. And of course it's the Cybermen. And I, their new leader, Cyber Jeff, will have ultimate victory over you, Doctor. Oh, yeah? Why is that? Because of a little help from my friends. I said a little help from my friends. Steve, Gavin, that was the signal. We rehearsed this. Sorry, Sorry Jeff. Jeff, it was a nightmare finding parking. I'm not even going to explain why that excuse does not hold up. But anyway, yes, Doctor. I am Cyber Steve. And I'm Gavin. And my name is also Steve. Fire. But it's here where the special plays its hand and reintroduces companions with a shared history with the Doctor. We've got Tegan and Ace, both of whom are companions who have already encountered the Daleks, the Cybermen and the Master. With Tegan, she obviously met the Master when he killed her Aunt Vanessa. <gasps> oh, Tegan Joe Funker. How's your Auntie Vanessa? Do you keep her in a little doll's house? But with Ace... And Ace! Or should I say Dorothy? Didn't the doctor ditch you? Yeah? Little fallout with your Machiavellian maestro. Last time I saw you, you were half cat. I love how he doesn't actually have a proper response to that. He just has to lay there and take it. I love it. Oh, and this comment to Kate Stewart. Your dad was an idiot. He was absolutely flashing back to the five doctors. I guarantee it. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Tegan and Ace know about the Cybermen and their weakness to gold, with Tegan having close encounters in the past, which is why it's great to base her at Unit when she has that hologram scene with the Fifth Doctor. We get to see Ace whack another Dalek with a baseball bat, and she uses her explosives at the volcano. This is genuinely smart distribution on Chibnall's part. However, Tegan and Ace have more in common with each other than just shared villains. They also had shared departures. Tegan's tenure was full of darkness and death, and in Resurrection of the Daleks, a story where the entire supporting cast die, including random strangers right in front of her for no reason. She decided then, 
it was time to leave. It stopped being fun. And she says goodbye to the fifth Doctor and Turlo in a corpse-ridden warehouse. Ace, on the other hand, did not get an actual on-screen departure. However, the book, At Childhood's End, written by Sophie Aldred, does depict their final adventure, where the seventh Doctor, the manipulative schemer, pushes her too far and causes her to accidentally kill a group of aliens in self-defense, and they parted ways. Obviously, the power of the Doctor does not directly specify what happened on screen, but either way, they parted on bad terms. So when it comes to Ace, Tegan, and now the 13th Doctor and Yaz, they're getting endings to their stories that they don't like. I'm aware that I'm jumping to the end of the special now, but when the Doctor gets blasted by that laser, falls unconscious, and then wakes up in the TARDIS later with Yaz, she says what I think is the most important line of the story. That's not right. I need more time. I want more time! Despite this lapse in her composure, however, and while previous incarnations have tried to stave off their fate or have expressed deep denial or reluctance, the 13th Doctor decides to leave their life on a high note, with a smile and a playful final line, going to the next stage in their life, embodying the Doctor that their previous incarnation wanted them to be in his final moments. The power of the Doctor, the power of Doctor Who in general, is not just the friends we made along the way, but it's the ability to evolve and happily adapt to the next stage. Now, on its own, this is not the most groundbreaking interpretation of regeneration. Heck, the Ninth Doctor basically did this with his final scene at the end of The Parting of the Ways. But this story's secret weapon is involving the companions in this. Now, putting aside the meta text of this interpretation, where not only did Ace not get her ending with the Doctor because she never got one on screen due to the show's cancellation, maybe Chris Chibnall has taken this approach to regeneration to reflect his own frustration at not being able to conclude his run the way he wanted to. We obviously don't know for sure right now, and like I said, this is just my interpretation, but with the massive changes and adjustments for Series 13 behind the scenes, due to COVID and lockdowns, which almost made Chris Chibnall quit the job entirely, maybe the unfinished business with the Doctor's past, division, her origins, or even small story details like Ashad's revival or Dan's departure, maybe this was all meant to be depicted another way. But Chibnall was dealt this particular hand, and he had to work with it and find an optimistic way for his Doctor to depart. So that's the meta angle of this, but what about the implementation of the companions in this story? Well, we've got Tegan and Ace getting closure with their respective doctors in hologram form, which is absolutely lovely. According to Janet Fielding and Sophie Aldred, Peter Davison and Sylvester McCoy really were there on set. They weren't green screened in. The fifth doctor mentions Adric, as it's understandably where Tegan's mind goes when seeing the Cybermen, and the seventh doctor gets to let Ace know how much he enjoyed seeing her flourish. It's wonderful, and it doesn't feel like fan service for the sake of fan service. And then, at the end of the story, when Graham has helped the TARDIS team save the Doctor, it's revealed he's gotten in touch with other companions, who they can share their experiences with. And we've got Joe, played by Katie Manning, Mel, played by Bonnie Langford, and one of the original 1963 companions, making his first appearance after 57 years since leaving, Ian Chesterton, played by William Russell. Once again, it's great fan service to see them, but I think they're here to make a broader point to the audience and also to Yaz, that there's life beyond the Doctor, that she's not alone. In this scene, she is the stand-in for fans who might be going through the changing of a Doctor and the loss of their favourite for the first time. We've had companions from the classic series who have gone through the same thing. The world didn't end, another Doctor went away and made new friends, and the beautiful cycle of this show continued. The power of the Doctor manages to take the fan experience of watching Doctor Who transition into a new era and make it the actual text of the story, and that's actually pretty astonishing. Heck, I think it's even quite clever to have Jacob Anderson return as Vinder to emphasise this point. Yeah, he has practically nothing to do here other than hold the Master at gunpoint, which is... Alright then, 
but then it helps if not every returning character comes from the classic series. Doctor Who did not end in 1989 and then nothing came after. We've got Graham and Vinda as part of the 13th Doctor's extended fam. And I don't think this is necessarily something that I'm overthinking here because the episode emphasizes this meaning further with the Master. I've made it no secret that I love this incarnation, and while his plan here feels so extraneous, Sasha Dewan is compelling throughout the whole special as just a performance, but in terms of the story, his plan is to steal the Doctor's body and ruin her legacy. Now we're going to approach this story point from the end and work backwards. When the Hollow Doctor, Yaz and Vinda are able to get the Master back into that regeneration chamber and use the Cyber Master energy to power the process, once again another clever bit of techno babble, the Master says this as he's changing back. This is a self-loathing master. And you know what? That tracks. I know a lot of you want to forget about the Timeless Children, but try and cast your minds back to that finale, where we've got the Master explaining how he discovered the secrets of the Doctor's past, and how much he hated the idea that his mortal enemy and pseudo-best friend is actually part of the Gallifreyan creation myth, that the Doctor is the special one, and instrumental in everything that he is, which he can't stand. So if the Doctor's so special, if she is so loved throughout the galaxy, and has an army of friends at their beck and call, then it makes a lot of sense for the Master to try and take that away from her and tarnish the legacy of the Doctor. Now on paper, the actual execution of this in the story is sketchy. The Master recruits Yaz as his companion, even though she's clearly the main one who is set up to maybe stop him, and promises to go on an adventure. And then the next time we see the Master, he's on this strange mushroom planet, watching two other civilizations destroy each other. He claims he caused this, but we have zero context here. Like, literally zero. Was there some sort of off-screen adventure that took place between scenes? Did the Master already have this planned out, or did he just arrive somewhere and improvised? This feels like a pretty key part of his plan and his philosophy in this episode, and the audience aren't privy to any of it. But in terms of the actual personality and charisma of Sasha Dewan, he is firing on all cylinders here. I genuinely love that scene when he's in the Doctor's TARDIS wearing her costume and really maliciously toying with Yaz and the TARDIS, mocking Yaz's sticky notes that she uses to help her fly the ship, and this reversal of the Master's catchphrase. I am the Doctor, and you will obey me. And when the Master gets right up in Yaz's face, it's actually scary, but the moment he screams at her, you can almost see in his eyes the realisation of what he's done. It seems to wash all over him before he recoils from the pain of the regeneration. Watch closely. If you think I am gonna let you- I am the Doctor now! I am the Doctor! It's almost like he can't quite believe that this has happened, that there's a universe without the Doctor and her shoes are now his to fill. A tinge of regret and he doesn't seem wholly self-assured. It makes sense that the next thing he'd do is start wearing a Frankenstein amalgamation of the Doctor's old costumes. And don't forget, the Master even refers to his alliance with the Daleks and the Cybermen as his own fam, the Doctor's adversaries being the counter to her companions. It's on the nose, but I can dig it. And in the end, when the Doctor gets her body back and puts everything right, the Master is dying on the Cyber Planet alone and in the dirt. He's got no one, and that's why he loses. It is a tragedy. In Spyfall Part 2, he describes himself as knowing in his heart that he's in the right place, doing what he was made for when he kills. This is his lot in life, and he hates it, which is why he fought so hard in this special to change it. But ultimately, he is the cause of the 13th Doctor's death, redirecting the Quarrenx's energy beam towards her. Prior Doctors have died to old age, radiation poisoning, fallen, American healthcare, but for 13, it was a big bloody laser. Now, I've talked about all of the big story stuff that I wanted to, so let's go over some random observations I had, both good and bad, in no particular order. Literally, I've just written a list. The Quarrenx takes the form of something that the onlooker wants to protect. Since we first see it in the story through the perspective of the Doctor, it takes the form 
of a young black child, possibly a call back to the timeless children, but a cool bit of visual storytelling as to what the Doctor would want to try and save the most. Kate Stewart makes a big deal in this episode about saving the unit soldiers from the Cybermen, but we only see her and Tegan escape the exploding building. I guess all those other soldiers can just die. I really like the scene where Tegan is trying to sneak through the elevator shaft, only for her to stumble and a shad hears her. Patrick O'Kane really is terrific as a shad. He's a really menacing villain. He deserved to be in stories that centered around him more. Renegade human and the wolves. Oh yeah! Though I do call a BS on Tegan somehow surviving that fall without explanation. I know Janet Fielding on Twitter said that she bounces, but it does feel like a cop out to keep the story moving. You refuse to pass through. Quite the strength of character, this incarnation. Hmm? Oh yeah, there's a scene with a bunch of classic doctors. I'd say this is the closest to the special comes to just outright fan service for the sake of it, but that's not inherently a bad thing, especially when it's applied in such an interesting way, where we're in the Doctor's subconscious, where there's a cliff edge guarded by past incarnations. It's symbolic, obviously. Consciousness will do that. I love that line. But yeah, David Bradley greets her as the first Doctor, then we've got all of the other surviving classic Doctor actors apart from Tom Baker, and they actually have banter with each other. It's terrific. And Paul McGann. Guardians of the Air. Sorry, why are you not wearing? I don't do robes. There's always one. Has to be different. I am a manifestation of our consciousness. I can wear what I like. Can we just focus on this, whatever this is? Do you want to know what fan service did annoy me, however? Joe Martin scene because it's just a walk on roll as in she literally just walks on the Cybermen shoot through her and then she stands there while Yaz brings back the Doctor and then she vanishes again. Yeah, the continuity is on point where Yaz does not recognise her as the Doctor because she's never actually met the fugitive, but it's just a waste of an astonishingly talented actor who has such screen presence as her incarnation of the Doctor. She walks in and then fades away with no further development to her story and while the expanded universe has already started trying to fill some gaps, the fact that we're coming to the end of the Chris Chibnall era era means we will likely never have a featured guest starring role for Joe Martin on screen ever again. And that's just sad. Well, my work is done here. What do you mean your work is done? You didn't do anything. <laughs> didn't I? And I understand that this special has a 90 minute time limit, but we don't get a Doctor Goodbye with Ace, Tegan or Kate, even though I liked the visual acknowledgement that this is Kate's first time in the TARDIS. Believe it or not, we actually do get a goodbye with Vinda, which is an interesting way to prioritise the script, but okay. It just seems a bit tone deaf considering how much Tegan in particular has been affected by not having a follow-up up until now. It's because of that vulnerability the Master was able to manipulate her into bringing that Russian Cyberman doll into unit in the first place. There's also this speech. I don't have time to factor you in. I have spent the past 30 years living like a nomad. I have done landmines, coups, I have been hijacked and I've nearly drowned trying to help people. I've seen off two husbands and somewhere out there is an adopted son who hasn't called me for six weeks. I have no idea what she's talking about here. It's framed as a heroic big moment for fans, but there's like zero context or precedent here. It falls flat on paper. But speaking of framing, let's talk about the episode's MVP, and that's director Jamie Magnus Stone and his DOP Robin Wennery, who are more than up to the task of taking a 90 minute script and not making a single scene feel like a visual throwaway despite a BBC budget. Every scene seemingly has a dynamic camera move, even scenes that could have just been conventionally filmed, like when Kate surrenders to a shad. I love this dolly shot of the camera moving between the laser grid. It's great. There's some brilliant cinematography during the opening train set piece. I love how cool the Daleks look under that volcano, as well as the extended shots of Cyberman action in the unit base. Even scene transitions are fun, with the Doctor and Yaz escaping the cyber planet and into the TARDIS in one shot. This does feel like a blockbuster, with really extravagant production values, and while the musical highlight of the episode is the Rasputin bit, especially when the Cybermaster and the Daleks share that confused look. <laughs>
That is genuinely hysterically funny. Second Akinola really brought it for his final score of the series. I love how big and grandiose he goes with the train scene. The climactic showdown between the Doctor and the Master, it's a terrific score, which also repurposes the Master and the Cybermen's themes to great effect. I also think this is probably Mandip Gill's best performance as Yaz, and Yaz's best outing as a companion, because when you think about it, once Dan departs after the opening credits, She's the only companion formerly of the Doctor. It's the first time where she hasn't had to constantly share screen time with another member of a fam, and it works in her favour, though there is some clunky dialogue that probably should have been cut. Do you even know how to use that, love? Don't you worry. I've had weapons training. The Doctor's in danger. There must be Dalek teleporters that we can follow, that you can lock onto. Why am I talking to you? But I really did like Yaz here. As a companion, she felt like an obligatory inclusion in series 11, but as this era has progressed, she's coming to her own more and more, peaking here, where she essentially recreates the ending of the Caves of Androzani and takes the Doctor back to the TARDIS. Really cool callback if that was intentional. Though, when you think about it, what Yaz did in this story really wasn't that significant. The story just makes it feel big. She pushes the Master out of the TARDIS, the Hollow Doctor turns up, which reminds me, she said there's only one chance to come back to life again. Oh, no chance. I've seen it in extreme circumstances. It's incredibly dangerous. Anything could happen. But these supposed stakes and this incredible danger, this never gets followed up on. She just says this and nothing reinforces it. Anyway, she then pretends to have made peace with the Master, so he comes back into the TARDIS, and then the Master pilots the TARDIS back to the Tsar's palace for some reason, and then that's when the Fugitive Doctor shows up and they channel the regeneration energy back in. Yaz didn't really do much, but she wore it well, I guess? Which nicely brings us towards the end. The Doctor was blasted by the Quarunks after the Daleks and the Cybermen have been stopped. All the loose ends are resolved, except those two warring planets. I guess they can just die. And also, Dan is homeless. Maybe the Doctor could have done something about that? But she can't, because she's too busy regenerating. And I'm not gonna lie, because they haven't built up or resolved any potential romantic tension between the Doctor and Yaz, Yaz doesn't really have a reason to leave here. She knows full well that there are other Doctors and other companions, so is she okay with it ending here? The Doctor just says, It's alright. It's alright, Yaz. One last trip. So the Doctor seems to instigate this departure, and because so much is left unsaid, because the Doctor and Yaz depart with a mournful glance across a park, we don't actually get any sort of subtext or depth to this leaving. Now, I think everything revolving around the Doctor in these closing scenes is terrific, and it's so wonderfully acted and performed by Jodie. She's so terrific in these quiet scenes. You, and Graham, and Ryan, and Dan, Nobody else got to be us. Nobody else got to live our days. Nobody. And my heart is so full of love of all of you. But the fact that Yaz has to leave, apparently, it doesn't feel justified. And I see the Doctor has taken the Kingdom Hearts approach to emotional conversations and brings ice cream. And yeah, we get our classic companions reminiscing as the Doctor asks the TARDIS to look after whoever comes next. I love how Thirteen does accept this fate. She sets her affairs in order to pave the way for her successor. Her final scene takes place on the Dirdle Door Arch, possibly by an incredible coincidence, a location that's just a stone's throw away from Season 26's The Curse of Fenric, where Ace jumped into the water for a rebirth metaphor and to renew her faith in the Doctor, just like she did in this story. Coincidence? I think not! And as she takes in a final sunset, her final lines of dialogue are perfectly performed. A tinge of sadness, but overwhelming optimism, and a playful nature, as we say goodbye to the woman who fell to earth. That's the only sad thing. I want to know what happens next. Right then. Don't 
Doctor whoever I'm about to be. Tag. You're it. And she regenerates into her 10th incarnation, or at least the same actor, who goes to say something and recognises the teeth. I know these teeth. New teeth. That's weird. What on earth is going on? Well, we're going to have to wait over a year to find out. But in the meanwhile, let's wrap up the power of the Doctor. Narratively, I don't want to call it a mess because there really are some clever structural and creative decisions here. But there is a lot of fluff, a lot of leaps the audience has to make. And I think that Yaz's decision, in quotes, to leave the TARDIS unprompted is the most forced thing about the ending. However, I've got to admit that by the end of watching this episode, I was emotionally exhausted. And not in a bad way, it's because I was profoundly moved by what the special did. It made so many throws towards so many emotional moments, and almost all of them hit bullseye with me. Now, there's definitely an argument to be made that The Power of the Doctor is a finale to a completely different era of the show, an era where there wasn't numerous unresolved plot threads or character revelations and mysteries yet to be explored, or in some cases just commented upon, like the destruction of Gallifrey. Those wanting to learn more about the Division, the Fugitive Doctor, the Timeless Child, or a relationship between the Doctor and Yaz or even Dan and Diane are going to leave bitterly disappointed. However, as a standalone blockbuster Doctor Who adventure, it's something else. It's fun, frequently funny, the Daleks and the Cybermen are mostly well implemented and I love everything about the Master. Jodie's terrific, the classic series callbacks are great, Tegan and Ace are surprisingly well utilised here, and there's something immensely special about seeing all of these classic Doctors and Companions utilised for an overarching theme of moving forward with a smile, of not being afraid of that symbolic cliff edge, of leaving the nest and flying, of never forgetting the people in your life who made you who you are, but also meeting new people who may need a friend as well. It's one of Doctor Who's best looking episodes, it's a huge production achievement, and if you approach it in the vein of a celebration of the show and its history, along with the BBC's, then it's one of Doctor Who's most triumphant stories. You can argue for hours and hours as to whether or not this era was leading up to a story like this, but this is still the ending that it got, and definitely ranks up there as one of my favourite regeneration stories, certainly the best since The Parting of the Ways. It doesn't prompt a massive re-evaluation of this Doctor's run, like something like The Caves of Androzani, but as a self-contained episode, it's surprisingly triumphant. It's an ending fitting for Jodie Whittaker, who has been nothing less than an incredible ambassador for the show, embodying the playful, adventurous spirit of the Doctor admirably. And Chris Chibnall, I sense frustration at not being able to get the ending of this era that he wanted with the incredible logistical mountains he had to climb over the past two years, but he stuck the landing with a huge finale that has a shaky start but blossoms into something wonderful. The blossomiest blossom. And now, with Russell T. Davis returning, David Tennant taking the reins until we meet Shooty Gatwa, Tag, you're it. Hey folks, thanks for watching this review of The Power of the Doctor. It's the end of an era, and I also am very tired. You can probably tell just by looking at my eyes. It's because I've been trying very hard to get this review out before I go to MCM Comic Con. But enough about me. I want to know what you folks thought of The Power of the Doctor and this review. Let me know in the comment section below. Also, be sure to like the video because it really, really helps me out. And subscribe to the channel for upcoming Doctor Who reviews. Also, I'm sure you've noticed all these incredibly handsome names that are scrolling down the screen right now. Those are my patrons. They help to keep the lights on here. They got this review a few days early, and they're also getting instant early access to my upcoming Hartnell Marathon, which starts in December. At time of making this review, the first five reviews of the Hartnell Marathon are ready to view for patrons. I'd also like to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Adam Gratton, Angus Bajanison, Callum Bird, Chiba City Blues, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Daniel Davis, Darren Carver Bausiger, Dean Jones, Dr. Hadley, Dragonbugs, Dylan Whitaker, 
Evil Dialect 79, Finley Rude, Flipmeister MK, Ginger Animator, Hunter Graham, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, Jared Saylor, Joseph Adams, Leela, Mario Fanboy 15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Nathaniel Holden, Palex, Raven Woods, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Ryan Duncan, Samuel Whitaker, Steve Fiore, Taylor Wooderson, The Brit Sniper, The Doctor 14 Blu ray Reviews, Timbo1834, Toby Loxton, Will, Zabi555, and Strange Folk. Thanks so much to all of my patrons. I'm off to sleep now. I'll see you folks next time.